Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Center for Jewish History. My name is Joel Levy. For those who don't know me, I'm the president of the center, and it's a great, great pleasure to welcome everybody here this evening. I think most people know, but I will repeat briefly, uh, that the center is a partnership of five organizations, the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, the Leo Beck Institute, the Yeshiva University Museum, and YIVO Institute for Historical Research. These organizations all have archives, and the archives come together under the roof and under the umbrella of the Center for Jewish History. The center uh, helps to ensure that the documents that are contained here are preserved and protected appropriately for archives, and also very, very importantly, made accessible to scholars and to others. At our core, we are, of course, a scholarly center, but we have many, many programs. We have exhibitions. We have fellowships for scholars. We have uh, a genealogy institute where many people come to do research on their own families and so on. But everybody comes together at the Center for Jewish History, making this the largest collection, the collection of those collections which belong to the partners, but collectively those collections are the largest repository of modern Jewish history, modern being just the last 1,000 years. Uh, we think in long term being Jewish as we are and having a long history. There are in this building about 100 million documents and um, they are available either because they're digitized, as we digitize many of them, or the original documents are available through the reading room when people go upstairs to do their research. So it's a wonderful, wonderful place. And among the very good activities we have is, are the exhibitions. We have an extraordinary exhibition up right now. I hope you've all seen it before the program this evening or that you will get to see it at some time. It's up until the beginning of August, August 6th. But we have the rare, rare opportunity of showing some of the treasures from Corpus Christi College, which was founded exactly 500 years ago. And to celebrate their 500th anniversary, they have sent uh, some of the items in their collections to the United States. They were shown earlier at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington and here. This is the first time that any of these items have ever left Corpus Christi or Oxford. And so it, it's a very, very rare privilege for us to have this particular exhibition. Uh, each item in the exhibition is a treasure in and of itself, but the whole thing together is just amazing. And we're doing a series of lectures in association, the first of which is this evening, and we're particularly fortunate to be able to host that. Um, the, the next talk is going to be actually next Tuesday. Roger Cohn of the New York Times will be here, and I hope everybody will come back, and for all the others in the series, you'll be able to get cards on the way out that list all the programs in this particular series. But I'd like to speak for just a, a moment about Oxford, which is famed for the ancient books and manuscripts in its libraries, which also hold some of the greatest Hebrew collections in the world. Less known, is the subject of this evening's lecture, the role of Oxford in the study and dissemination of texts in other Jewish languages, including Yiddish, Judeo-Spanish, Judeo-Persian, and Judeo-Provencal. Most extraordinary is the case of, the, of printing at Oxford in the mid-17th century, the first Judeo-Arabic book. We are honored that Brad Sabin Hill, one of the world's leading scholars on Hebraica and Judaica is speaking to us this evening. He's written many books on Incunabula, Hebraica, Judaica, including catalogs for some of the most important exhibitions of such rare materials ever to have been held. Uh, until very recently, Brad Sabin Hill was the curator of the I. Edward Kiev Judaica collection at George Washington University. He's held positions at the National Library of Canada, the British Library, the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies, and here, the Yivo Institute for Jewish Research. 
We are so, so pleased that you're with us this evening and look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Levy. Um, before I begin, uh, I'd just like to thank uh, David Block for his kind invitation uh, to speak uh, in conjunction with uh, the several venues of this exhibition, uh, as well as Nick Thorne of Corpus Christi College, uh, who discussed some of these issues with me, and of course to Joel Levy, uh, Julie Kaplan, and Miriam Heyer of the Center for Jewish History for their kindly facilitating uh, this event. Uh, the exhi ex exhibition here now uh, in New York after its venue in Washington marks the 500th anniversary of Corpus Christi College, whose foundation collection of manuscripts and books, medieval Hebrew, Greek, and scientific texts, old English texts, is unequaled among all the college libraries of Oxford. Uh, among the Hebrew manuscripts are seven from medieval England, these considered the most important group of Anglo-Hebrew manuscripts from the Middle Ages, that is, from before the expulsion of the Jews from England in the year 1290. The Corpus Library now benefits from a new and most learned catalog of its Hebrew manuscripts. I don't think there's a bookstore here anymore, um, but at the Folger there is a bookstore, and um, uh, people, people could pick up there um, the uh, most sumptuous catalog of Hebrew manuscripts uh, of any Oxford college uh, in which uh, the scholar uh, Peter Porman uh, provides uh, much background on the early history of Hebrew in the college and in Oxford in the, 15th, uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. Hebrew studies have been cultivated in England, in England since the Middle Ages when Oxford was a center of Jewish learning, Jewish learning among Jews, and both Jewish and Christian scholars produced and possessed several of the manuscripts displayed now here in this exhibit. Uh, collections of Hebrew manus manuscripts and books were acquired by several Oxford colleges, and the Bodleian Library, named for its first librarian, Thomas Bodley, himself a very gifted Hebraist, records Hebrew books in its first catalog. Among subsequent librarians, and sub-librarians as they're called there, were outstanding Hebrew scholars, including Thomas Hyde in the 17th century, the Hungarian Janos Uri at the end of the 18th, Adolf Neubauer, the first Jew among them in the 19th century, and A.E. Cowley uh, at the beginning of the 20th. All of these were uh, famous names in the history of uh, Hebrew and Oriental studies um, and associated with the uh, libraries and collections in Oxford. The Corpus Christi College has been associated with Hebrew studies since the 16th century, when one of its alumni, John Sheprieve, became the first Regis, that is, royal professor of Hebrew at Oxford, when the Regis professorships were first established. But it was in the 17th century, the great age of Christian Hebraism and Orientalism, when one scholar educated at Corpus made his mark in pioneering contributions on, um, uh, in the field of Hebrew and, and Oriental uh, studies. Edward Pocock. whose life spanned the century, was one of the greatest Orientalists of his day, not just in Oxford, not just in England, but of all of Europe. Uh, his work was exceptional in its scope and originality. Born in Oxford, he read Hebrew and Greek, uh, that is, he studied Hebrew and Greek at Corpus, and later studied Arabic under the tutelage of William Bedwell, uh, the leading English scholar of Arabic in that day. He also studied Syriac, and his edition of Syriac New Testament texts was published in Holland in 1630. Under the influence of Dutch Orientalists, he decided to further his studies in the East, appointed chaplain to the Levant Company, otherwise known as the Turkey Merchants. Those were the, um, the businessmen, the international uh, traders uh, from England who went to uh, the Levant, to Turkey, uh, to what is today Turkey, Syria, uh, and uh, accompanied by some scholars or a chaplain and scholars, um, who were of an English presence in the Orient over a very long period. 
he um, affixed himself with this, uh, this group, um, and several members of Corpus Christi College uh, filled this role over time. And he left for uh, Aleppo that same year in 1630. During the five and a half years he spent in Syria, he deepened his, his knowledge of the Oriental languages and texts, to which he added Samaritan and Ethiopic. He also collected manuscripts from hi for himself and for the Archbishop of Canterber Canterbury, William Laud, who invited him to take, he lost his head later, but um, um, uh, William Laud, the Archbishop, invited him to take up a new chair of Arabic at Oxford. In 1637, after he'd come back to Oxford, he made a second trip to the east, this time to Constantinople, today known as Istanbul, uh, where he remained for three years. At Istanbul, he made the acquaintance of Jacob Romano, a Jewish scholar and bibliophile who helped him acquire Hebrew manuscripts and introduced him to Jewish literature in Arabic. Pocock also met an eccentric German Orientalist by the name of Christian Raua, Ravius or Raua, who was briefly, uh, later briefly in Oxford, a very brief, brief period for a matter of months, and one of whose works may have influenced Pocock. After his return to England, Pocock continued to teach uh, both Hebrew and Arabic at Oxford while devoting himself to scholarship. He played a large, in fact, the largest role in the preparation of Walton's Polyglot Bible, one of the most complex works in the history of Oriental typography ever, in the history of the world, for which he contributed Syriac, Ethiopic, and Persian manuscripts, and edited himself the Arabic Pentateuch, the, the Humash uh, in Arabic. Apart from his contribution to Arabic, Hebrew, and Syriac scholarship, he also published a pamphlet on coffee, to which he had become addicted in the East. And some of you uh, who may have visited Oxford may remember the Queen's Coffee Shop on the High Street or the Grand Cafe opposite the Queen's Coffee Shop, which were the locations of the first coffee houses in England, founded in the 17th century in Pocock's day, uh, supposedly by Turkish Jews. Um, we take for granted coffee, but there was a time when it was first introduced in the, um, in the Western world. Most um, original and unusual of Pocock's works. Um, you won't see that said uh, in the literature, but that's what I'm speaking about here this evening. The most unusual and original of all of Pocock's many works was Porta Moses, uh, The Gate of Moses, an edition of Maimonides' introduction to the six divisions of the Mishnah, with Pocock's Latin translation and detailed commentary published in 1655 a year before the readmission of Jews to England. This was the first book-length text printed in Hebrew characters at Oxford. Um, scattered words or short passages in Hebrew had appeared uh, within Latin works printed uh, in that city since the end of the 16th century, uh, of which this is an example. And even earlier in London, around 1524, in a treatise by another Regis professor of Hebrew, Pocock's book came out well before a full running text in Hebrew was printed at Cambridge. Oxford beat Cambridge in this, in this uh, competition. And a century, uh, or nearly a century, before uh, Jews in London began to print their own books in Hebrew and Yiddish. They did that over the course of the 18th century. But as I said, this book was produced in Oxford a year before the readmission of Jews to England. There were virtually no Jews living in England, some Moranos, uh, in Pocock's day. And uh, when thinking about uh, this lecture, uh, I always uh, prepare for the question, which I'm just going to anticipate now, so no one has to ask it. How could this book have been set, typeset, in Oxford? How could it have been printed in Oxford in 1655? There were no Jewish scholars who who knew Hebrew, let alone Judeo-Arabic, in Oxford in 1655. And we know, for example, from other great works of Oriental and Hebrew typography, for example, the Alcala Polyglot of um, Alcala de Henares in Spain uh, around uh, 1517, that uh, the Hebrew text of that was set with the assistance of converted Jews after the expulsion of uh, the Jews from Spain. Uh, we imagine 
that the Hebrew text of the, uh, pent of the uh, polyglot uh, Psalter, printed in Genoa in 1516, which is considered the first real polyglot book of any sort, with texts in Hebrew, Greek, Arabic, uh, uh, Aramaic, and, um, and uh, Latin, that this, the Hebrew text in that must have been set with the, with the assistance of Jews, and after all, there were plenty of Jews in Italy, whether they were uh, practicing Jews or converted Jews, but it's unimaginable that there wasn't some Jewish involvement in that, and there could well have been, because it was Italy. Uh, and over the course of time, uh, over the centuries, there were other instances of Hebrew printing, um, lengthier texts, where generally there was some sort of Jewish involvement, not simply Christian scholars of Hebrew, but Jews involved in the, uh, in the production of the book. Now here we have a book printed in 1655, um, not even in Hebrew, in Judeo-Arabic, which, uh, which I'll come back to in a moment, which was set at a time when there were no Jews living in Oxford. You have to imagine that not only was it set by someone, but whoever was typesetting it had to be able to read the original manuscript. And it was based on Maimonides' own hand, the, a manuscript of my, in Maimonides' own hand, which is still preserved today in Oxford. So somebody had to be able to read that manuscript while he's typesetting the book. Whether Pocock himself transcribed it into a more legible or perhaps square characters so that a typesetter could work on it, or uh, did Pocock himself involve himself in the typesetting, which I haven't seen uh, cited anywhere? It seems to me a uh, riddle. Um, and that takes away the question which I hoped somebody would ask um, as to how this book was ever produced in Oxford in 1655. Um, Pocock's um, book is often cited as the first book printed in Hebrew type at Oxford, an entire book, a book-length text. Uh, but it, the thing is, it's not in Hebrew. The Hebrew is almost entirely Judeo-Arabic, that is, Arabic written in Hebrew characters. Even the title page has an added, um, has an added, has an added uh, main title at the very top of the page. You can see Bab Musa, the yud at the end is pronounced as a Bab Musa, the gate of Moses in Arabic and Hebrew characters. Even, um, so the book must be seen in the context not only of Hebrew printing, but of Arabic. Over time, Arabic has been written and printed not only in Arabic characters, uh, but uh, also in the Syriac, Hebrew, Coptic, Samaritan, and Latin alphabets, depending on whether the text was by or for Eastern Rite Christians, uh, Oriental Jews, Copts in Egypt, Samaritans in Palestine, or Catholics in Malta. We have in our mind that Arabic is written in Arabic characters, but in fact, historically, Arabic has been written and printed in a variety of, of characters. If the book was the first edition of a Judeo-Arabic text in Britain, it was not the first appearance of Arabic in a book printed in England. Uh, some woodcut Arabic also figured along with Hebrew in that book printed in London in 1524, um, the upcoming 500th anniversary, that'll be seven years from now, of uh, Hebrew and Arabic printing in the British Isles um, surely merits a celebration. I don't know if I'll be involved, but uh, I can imagine that uh, there'll be more than hummus and pita and gefilte fish at high tables in Oxford and Cambridge um, in uh, recognition of this uh, wonderful 500th anniversary date. In the 17th century, which saw a flourishing of Arabic studies in Europe, the Oxford Press bought type from Leiden in Holland. Holland was then a center of Arabic uh, typography. And Pocock's Specimen Historiae Arabum, a compilation of um, Arab history, was in 1650, the first book printed in England with extensive Arabic text within the book. That was five years before Pocock published this Maimonides uh, in Judeo-Arabic. Um, from that statement alone, one can see how remarkable an Orientalist Pocock was. I started out by mentioning his first work, which was a Syriac text. Um, then he published um, a selection of uh, Arabic um, historical texts. Five years later, he published, and this is quite a, 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 a 
detailed work, a translation and commentary, tra original text, translation, and commentary on Maimonides' uh, commentary in the Mishnah in Judeo-Arabic. That's just so far. Contrary to most people's uh, preconceptions, script is not related to language but to religion. Thus, Western Christians have always written their language in Latin, Roman characters. Uh, that's why all of us uh, in the, uh, from Western Europe and the Americas write our languages in Latin characters. Orthodox European nations historically wrote their languages in Cyrillic or Greek uh, script. Armenians and followers of the Syriac rite, the Eastern uh, uh, Christian rites, used their scripts for multiple languages. And Muslims historically wrote their languages, such as Persian, Turkish, Urdu, and Malay, aside from Arabic, in Arabic characters. From the Middle Ages, uh, Jews wrote their various vernaculars in Hebrew characters. That um, is um, a, a selection of the pages, uh, the first pages of text, uh, or early pages of, uh, of one of the divisions of, um, of this work uh, in Judeo-Arabic in one column with the translation in the other. Uh, I can't help mentioning that if you look at the top right column, um, uh, the top, the, 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 the right-hand page, the top of the, 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 te the first line of text, it refers to Sharia, Sharia, which is referring here to what? To law, but in the context of Jewish law, um, uh, rabbinic law, um, as it's uh, described and uh, transmitted over the generations as in Pirkei Avot, because this deals with Pirkei Avot. Um, and so there we see Sharia being used as the term for law. In this case, Jewish law. In another context, it's Muslim law. I can well imagine, though I haven't uh, checked this as a certainty, uh, it's probably used by Eastern Rite Christians in the context of um, canon law, Catholic or Eastern Rite uh, canon law. So it doesn't have to do with what most people um, have in their minds nowadays. Um, whole literatures, whole literatures uh, developed in some of these languages written in uh, the Hebrew alphabet, such as Yiddish, Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Spanish, and Judeo-Persian, not to mention Aramaic, written in the same characters as Hebrew since antiquity. As of the in introduction of printing in the 15th century, texts in these languages began to appear in print. Uh, Book-length texts in Aramaic were printed in Spain or Portugal before the expulsion. Uh, there are two fragments. There are only fragments, entirely in Aramaic, Targum, uh, the likes of which don't appear anywhere else uh, subsequently uh, in Europe or anywhere over time, which seem to be pages of editions of the Targum, of the Aramaic text, without anything else. Usually we imagine that the Targum is printed together with the Hebrew text, the biblical text. But uh, in Spain, it seems they uh, printed, we have reason to think they printed on the basis of these two fragments that survive, entire running Aramaic texts without anything uh, else. Um, by uh, the first uh, half of the 16th century, um, texts had been printed by Jews in Aramaic, Judeo-Italian, Ladino, Judeo-Spanish, Yiddish, Judeo-Greek, Judeo-Persian, and Judeo-Arabic. That's been the first half of the 16th century. In the second half of the 16th century, there was a Judeo-Provençal uh, uh, printed, uh, in fact, by emigres from, uh, from Europe, uh, in, um, uh, from, from the south of, uh, from Provence, in, um, in Istanbul. Um, Judeo-Greek and uh, Judeo-Spanish uh, had been printed, uh, uh, I'll just show you what this is, on the, the one I just showed you, that, the left-hand left -hand page, that's from uh, uh, a piot, uh, 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 in Aramaic from Barco, a town in northern Italy. It's a little town in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's, it's like a pig farm, and there's one, one castle, baby castle, in the middle of the town where I guess the, the lord of the manor lived. It seems in that castle, Gershom Soncino, 
printed one and perhaps two or three books in 1496, 1497, maybe 1498. One of them has uh, uh, this example of Aramaic printing, a full, full page just in uh, Aramaic. The right-hand page is uh, the first um, book-length text in Judeo-Italian from Fano, northern Italy in 1505. Uh, here's Judeo-Greek from Istanbul. That's from a unique surviving book that I chased all through Paris to find. Uh, there's no copy known anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's in the Bibliothèque Mazarine in, uh, in Paris, an old, an old um, um, bishop, a cardinal's bishopric library, in a beautiful old building in Paris, um, which has uh, great treasures among them, the only surviving copy of the Book of Job in Hebrew and Judeo-Greek. And there you have an example of Ladino or Judeo-Spanish printed in Venice in 1713. Uh, text in Judeo-Tatar, the Turkic language of the Karaites, uh, and Judeo-Provençal were then printed in the 18th century. Provençal had also been briefly printed in the 16th. Likewise, in Hebrew type. That's uh, uh, Karaite Tatar. It's a grammar of Hebrew in Karaite Tatar printed in the Crimea. Uh, around 1837. Um, books in Judeo-Urdu came out in uh, the late 19th century in both Calcutta and Bombay. This is an example of one of the two incomplete surviving copies of uh, this uh, illustrated uh, Judeo-Urdu uh, text in um, entirely in Urdu. It's, a, it's actually it's printed. It's a lithograph, which means it was uh, printed from handwriting using a technique which was widespread in, in India in particular in the 19th century, but printed in multiple copies, but only two copies survive, both in the Valmadonna Trust Library, which is now at the National Library of Israel. And whenever I encounter someone from the subcontinent, whether uh, Muslim or Hindu, I recite lines from this because it's the most famous fairy tale uh, known to every child uh, in, in India, or Pakistan, um, known as Indar Saba, the court of Indra, Indar. Uh, Ahmed Saba pri ki bij sab, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Sabs pri ki bij Saba ki, the green fairy entered into the court. That's just that paragraph. There's all kinds of paragraphs, and there's a red fairy, a green fairy, a, 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 a devil, a... Uh, you know, the whole slew of characters, and the book is illustrated in this way, in, in Indian style. On the right, you see an example of uh, Judeo-Persian from Tehran. Not, that's even that's um, separate from the Judeo-Bukharan books that were printed by the Jews of Bukhara uh, in Jerusalem in the late 19th century. This is actually from Persia, uh, from uh, Iran. And there were whole newspapers printed there in Judeo-Persian. The interesting thing about this book is it, it contains a table of the uh, 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 Perso-Arabic characters used by non-Jews. Now, the whole book is in Hebrew characters. Um, but it seems that there was uh, either an awareness that uh, Jews were starting to read Persian, or for the sake of Jews who were starting to read Persian, there is a table of the of equivalence uh, between the Ar Arabic, Perso-Arabic, and uh, Hebrew characters. Uh, before the emigration of East European Yiddish-speaking Jews to the four corners of the globe, Judeo-Arabic was the most widespread of the various Jewish languages extending from Morocco to India. Uh, Pocock uh, was the first non-Jewish scholar, I have to figure out which button to press here. Oh, there we go. There's Judeo-Tat, uh, which is uh, a distant Iranian language, printed in Baku in 1929. This is under the Soviets. Um, around this time, the Soviet, uh, until then, there was printing in uh, Judeo-Tat uh, for the mountain Jews, the so-called Gorsky Evrei, the mountain Jews of, um, of, uh, of this uh, region. Uh, this uh, is a, um, a school text, and it appeared in just about the last year that books in this language, in these characters, were allowed to be printed under Soviet rule. The Soviets um, 
uh, determined that uh, for the sake of literacy, all of the Central Asian languages, which were not uh, written by a large proportion of the population, much of the population was illiterate, the Central Asian languages, which included the language of the Jews, should uh, be written in a modern character, and uh, that way everyone would learn the same character. And they uh, Latinized all printing and publishing of the languages in, in Soviet Central Asia. Until they realized that um, Turkey was Latinizing Turkish under Ataturk, and by Latinizing the Turkic languages in Central Asia, those people might start identifying with, with Turkey. At which point, uh, similarly under a duress, they forced all of the writers and uh, printers to switch again to Cyrillic characters. So first they had written in their native characters, whether in Arabic or in the case of the Jews in Hebrew characters. For a short period, a few years, they printed in Latin characters. And then they switched again to Cyrillic characters. And there are a few instances of newspapers where you can see on the masthead the switch between those two characters. There's still a Hebrew title, but the rest of it is in the other, the other alphabet. Um, uh, and then that uh, language continued to be spoken, uh, and I think it's still spoken by some people in Queens, but it was not written in Hebrew characters after uh, the 1920s. This is an example of its last, uh, one of its last publications. And then here you have an example of Judeo-Spanish uh, from Istanbul uh, from 1931, La Voz de Oriente, uh, the voice of the East, now, this newspaper is interesting because it's in Hebrew characters. It began as a Hebrew character Ladino newspaper. But uh, it came out around the time that Ataturk began to uh, Latinize Turkish. So Jews thought, well, if Turkish is being Latinized, we really should start Latinizing Ladino. And so half of the issues of this newspaper were printed in Latin characters and half of them in Hebrew characters, except they were printed in Latin characters according to the Turkish alphabet, not according to any Spanish alphabet with which the Jews had absolutely no connection, either then or at any time in the past, but uh, now with the, according to the Turkish orthography. So it looks extremely funny to someone who knows Spanish, but for a Jew from Istanbul who uh, was raised uh, with uh, Ladino in Hebrew characters and now is in an environment where Turkish is being Latinized, the Ladino is written in Turkish uh, orthography. I didn't bring an example of that, but I just wanted to uh, expand on that uh, useless detail. Um, Pocock was the first non-Jewish scholar to take any interest in any of the literatures in Hebrew character Jewish languages other than Hebrew and Aramaic. Now that again is another uh, example of how unusual this personality was. Until Pocock, there were plenty of uh, Christian Hebraists, uh, Christian scholars of Hebrew who were interested in the Hebrew Bible, uh, even might be interested in uh, rabbinic texts, who uh, might be interested in Targum and Aramaic, uh, who studied both Hebrew and Aramaic for biblical texts or rabbinic texts, but they had no interest in anything else. There were some German scholars who were interested in Yiddish, but only as a means to convert Jews to Christianity. And in their publications, and there are some publications before um, the middle of the uh, 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 16th, 17th century, there were uh, non-Jewish uh, 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 scholars of Yiddish who invested their efforts into Yiddish, uh, but their only concern was in somehow reaching the Jews, writing things for the Jews, transliterating Christian texts for the sake of the Jews, but not in Jewish literature in, uh, in Yiddish. Um, since the 16th century, Christian Hebraists had uh, displayed this interest and published a few conversionist tracts, such as Gospels um, in German and Hebrew characters, as if that were Yiddish. Uh, and aware that Jews wrote their languages in Hebrew character, there's even uh, one um, polemicist who uh, printed the Ave Maria 
in Latin, in Hebrew characters, for the sake of Jews. I mean, if you want the Jews to pray with you, they should be able to read the prayers. But they can't read the prayers because they only know the Hebrew alphabet. So he printed the Ave Maria in Hebrew characters in Latin for the sake of Jews. Um, aware, um, um, aware of Jewish languages, and in particular of the language of the Jews in the Orient, uh, Pocock, um, uh, with his Porta Moses, produced the first edition of any original Hebrew character text in a Jewish language published by a non-Jewish seventh. There was no instance anywhere in Europe of a, a non-Jewish scholar publishing a text in a Jewish language other than Hebrew and Aramaic uh, until Pocock's edition of this book. This was decades before Christian Hebraists in Germany began to publish editions of original Yiddish texts. Uh, the famous Christian Hebraist Wagenseil in 1699 published an anthology of Yiddish texts. More than 40 years after Pocock published Maimonides in Judeo-Arabic. Um, and then at the beginning of the 18th century, there were some uh, Christian Hebraists who became aware of other Jewish languages, published samples of Jewish texts in Judeo-Spanish, in Judeo-Greek, um, um, in Judeo-Persian and uh, so on, just as short specimens. How is it that Pocock came to publish a text in a Jewish language, more precisely the first original text in Judeo-Arabic, which no European Orientalist had done before? He was certainly a man out of his time, but there may have been a few spurs to the undertaking. Pocock's German acquaintance, his eccentric German acquaintance from Istanbul, Christian Rauer, um, had published selections from the Quran in Arabic, in Hebrew characters, uh, set in Hebrew type, uh, apparently due to his Amsterdam printer's inability to set Arabic. The printer in Amsterdam had no Arabic type. So Rawa figured, okay, well then we'll print it in Hebrew type. Why? Because he had an awareness that Hebrew was one of the scripts in which Arabic could be written. So if the press doesn't have Arabic type, we can print it in Hebrew type. And, um, and that was the first instance of uh, another text other than the Judeo-Arabic uh, Pentateuch translation of the middle of the 16th century being printed in Judeo-Arabic. So first we have the Chumash from Istanbul, then we have the Quran in uh, Judeo-Arabic uh, from I Amsterdam. Um, but again, it was only because of the lack of type that it was said in Hebrew characters. Uh, and it wasn't the only instance of that. Um, uh, some years later, again in the uh, 17th century, another Quran, a much more um, ambitious work, that's Ave Maria in, uh, in uh, Hebrew characters. You read from right to left, Ave Maria, Grazia Deo, uh, Grazia Plena, you know, etc., etc. Um, here is uh, Wagenseil's um, 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 anthology of uh, Yiddish texts. In fact, this is um, um, his edition of uh, the Arthurian tales in Yiddish, but an original Yiddish composition. Um, re in fact, really original Yiddish composition. It's not just a Jewish translation of Arthurian tales. It's a variant of the Arthurian tales, which uh, Wagenseil printed in 1699, 44 years after Pocock. Uh, that's uh, Judeo-Greek. Uh, printed by one of the great Christian Hebraists who was in touch with Sabbateans in Hamburg in 1727 um, uh, with uh, you know, parallel texts in, in Greek. But the Hebrew is not transliterated from the Greek. The Greek is transliterated from the Hebrew because this is Judeo-Greek as written by Jews in Hebrew characters. Um, that's the uh, Quran, the first edition of Quran in uh, Hebrew characters. Now, I have to tell you, in the history of editions of Quran, there weren't uh, many editions of Quran before modern times. So one of the few editions of Quran before modern times is in Hebrew characters, uh, printed in Amsterdam. Uh, so this is a curious, uh, curious text. But you can see that the author was indeed eccentric. Uh, he was known as an eccentric. He was weird. He was in Oxford for a couple of months. He had met Pocock in, in Istanbul. Then he tried out his luck in uh, Oxford, it didn't work, it didn't last long, uh, because he says at the beginning on the left-hand column, 
he says that we're going to print this in Latin characters. Well, I don't see any Latin characters for the Arabic text. The Arabic text ended up being printed in Hebrew characters. Um, so he must have originally had the idea, we don't have Arabic characters, so I'll transliterate it into Latin characters, and we'll print the Arabic in Latin characters. But then he must have realized, oh, wait, we've got Hebrew characters here in this press. It was a press which hadn't used Hebrew characters uh, before, or had almost used no Hebrew used almost no Hebrew characters. Uh, and um, so he then realized, well, we can print it in Hebrew characters. It's more logical than printing in Latin characters. Uh, this is the later one, a much a, a more serious work, uh, someone who's not an eccentric, but one of the great Orientalists, uh, who printed uh, two chapters of the Quran, two surahs of the Quran, uh, in the original Arabic in Hebrew characters and Latin translation. So you see, if you look at the top of the uh, right-hand page, um, it it's describes the surah, and then the text begins. I can't see what I'm writing on it. Uh, it says, Bism Allah al-Rahman al-Rahim. You see that? It's Arabic and Hebrew characters. Well, I didn't reproduce here. I'm sorry, uh, I, I wanted to get the page. As a motto for this book, the motto uh, like a, on a dedication page, but it's a, sort of a motto, uh, at the beginning of the volume, after the title page, has just one line in Arabic and Hebrew characters. It's, la, it's the Shahida, as it were. La, la, ila, la. Isa, Rasulallah. There is no God but God. Jesus is his messenger. Um, which is very striking to see. But of course, that appears in Hebrew characters, so no Muslim scholar who only knows Arabic characters could read that. But Christian Orientalists in Europe, who at that time universally studied Hebrew, Arabic, uh, Greek, Latin, Syriac, and other Oriental languages, could read it and think that's pretty clever. You know, uh, that's, um, that's the way it should be. And um, I'm sorry I didn't reproduce that page because it's just so, it's so striking uh, to see it. Um, more importantly than uh, this um, eccentric in Istanbul whom uh, Pocock had met and who spent a little bit of time in Oxford, uh, there was, and this edition of the Quran came out later in the 17th century after Pocock had printed his work. In fact, it even refers to Pocock's work uh, in it as one of the reasons that one can produce a text in Arabic and Hebrew characters, because this is one of the first such texts ever printed. But before this, there was only Pocock and the eccentric before him. So what was the other? What was the other? I think there was another stimulus to uh, Pocock's printing in Judeo-Arabic. And a, more, um, and a more interesting and serious one, and that is a Pocock's Jewish friend in Istanbul, whom he held in the highest esteem, Jacob Romano, who must have been a, um, a um, well, he was from a wealthy uh, family, a bibliophile, a bibliophile family. It was a bibliophile family over centuries. Um, we had in Washington a book that was uh, printed expressly for for him, for one of the members of this family, a, a, century, a century later. Um, so it was a line of bibliophiles. Uh, Jacob Romano had wanted to publish Maimonides' philosophical treatise, uh, The Guide for the Perplexed, uh, in the original Judeo-Arabic. It had never been done before, and it had no, nothing of Maimonides ever, had ever been printed in Judeo-Arabic before. Only translations of Maimonides. Um, when Maimonides wrote in Judeo-Arabic, his uh, great works written in Judeo-Arabic other than Mishnah Torah, which was in Hebrew, uh, they were all promulgated among Jews, printed and published and distributed in Hebrew translation. But they existed in Judeo-Arabic originals, which were still used by Arabic, Judeo-Arabic speaking Jews uh, throughout the Orient. Um, he had a manuscript, Romano had a manuscript, I think that's the manuscript that Pocock must have acquired and brought uh, to Oxford or acquired for Oxford, of Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed in Judeo-Arabic. He had wanted to print it, he didn't manage to do it. In Istanbul there had only been that one book, the Humash in uh, multiple ling languages. There had never been any printing of an entire work in Judeo-Arabic uh, and Jacob Romano didn't succeed in doing it. But um, Pocock had it in his mind that this sort of work can and should be published. 
But uh, that was a more ambitious work. Uh, nothing came of that plan. Uh, but instead, he uh, published the uh, commentary on the Mishnah, or the, I should say the introductions uh, to uh, the, uh, the Mishnah uh, in Judeo-Arabic uh, as his venture into the field of publishing uh, and uh, uh, studying and publishing uh, Judeo-Arabic uh, literature. So I think that Romano's interest in Maimonides, uh, publishing an edition of Maimonides, must have figured in uh, Pocock's mind when he produced Bab Musa, Porta Moses, uh, the uh, introductions to uh, the Mishnah. This is an example of a uh, Judeo-Arabic manuscript of Maimonides, very old, uh, Yemen, 1380. And I take particular pleasure in saying that I rediscovered this manuscript. Uh, it was uh, lost in the bowels of the India office, London, uh, when I worked in the British Library. Uh, I found it recorded in an old uh, manuscript list. I pulled it up, and it turns out it is an absolutely beautifully um, uh, decorated, uh, not illustrated, but decorated manuscript in multiple colors of uh, Maimonides' uh, Dalalat al-Haririn, the Guide to the Perplexed, in Judeo-Arabic, and an old man. That's not what, uh, what uh, uh, it has no connection with Pocock, but that's an example of the transmission of Judeo-Arabic literature uh, among Jews before the introduction of uh, printing. Now, Pocock was very aware of Judeo-Arabic literature, of which his edition of Maimonides was a preliminary sample. Yet only centuries later did Orientalists and bibliographers begin to describe and edit the Judeo-Arabic manuscripts preserved in the great European libraries in Leiden, Munich, Berlin, and Oxford. Steinschneider's Bibliotheca Arabico-Judaica, a broad survey of medieval literature in Judeo-Arabic, didn't appear until 1902, almost 250 years after Pocock's work. Pocock's edition of a Judeo-Arabic text was the first contribution of an Oxford scholar, or for that matter, any scholar in England, to the study of a Jewish language other than Hebrew, or anywhere for that matter, any non-Jew, uh, than, uh, um, uh, than Hebrew and Aramaic, centuries before scholars in Oxford or working on Oxford collections made seminal contributions to the study of other Jewish languages, including Yiddish, Judeo-Provençal, Judeo-Spanish, and Judeo-Greek, which uh, figured in the course of uh, original contributions of Oxford scholars in the 19th and 20th centuries. Pocock's edition of a Judeo-Arabic text was not only exceptional within European Orientalist scholarship and Arabic studies of his day, since no other Arabist in Europe which was filled with Arabists in the 17th century, it was also exceptional in the history of Hebrew printing and in particular in the printing of Judeo-Arabic. To get a sense of just how unusual and pioneering this publication was, one need only consider the record of what had been printed in Judeo-Arabic before it and what appeared after it. As a rule, the historians of Arabic printing are at a loss to work with Judeo-Arabic. The modern historians often don't know Hebrew, can't read Judeo-Arabic. Um, and the literature, the scholarly literature, is a chock full of inexactitudes and misunderstandings. Uh, I'm being very diplomatic when I put it that way, but um, it's just really riddled with, uh, with um, uh, mistakes. For that reason, the sketch I'm about to give, I'm pleased to say, is altogether original. Uh, in the incunable period, that's, that's Steinschneider's uh, survey of Judeo-Arabic literature, which has never been bettered. Um, in the incunable period before 1500, two Hebrew books included some Judeo-Arabic. Before the end of the, the earliest days of printing, a trilingual dictionary of Hebrew, Italian, Arabic, entirely in Hebrew characters, was printed at Naples in 1488. This was, in fact, the first full-length dictionary to include Arabic. An example of a single uh, lexeme, a single word, is echad. If you look at echad, it says next to it, I'm sorry, it's probably not clear to you, echad, then it says uno, which is uh, Italian, and then it says wahad. The whole book is like that from beginning to end, and it has uh, samples of the use of the, uh, of the words uh, following, but every Every, every entry in this book has these three languages. I believe it's the first polyglot, multilingual dictionary um, uh, ever printed. There were dictionaries, but this is the first multilingual dictionary. And, of course, um, it's the first um, 
dictionary of, uh, of a Jewish language ever um, in print. That was from 1488. Um, um, then a Passover Haggadah with instructions in Judeo-Arabic was printed around 1490 somewhere in Spain or Portugal. There's no way of knowing where. First of all, there's no s complete copy that survives. There used to be a copy in Vienna. It's no longer there. There is one copy in Jerusalem, I wonder where that came from, um, which uh, is the only uh, extant copy in the world, but it's not a complete copy, it's only fragments of the, uh, of the, of the book. It's an illustrated Haggadah, which makes it uh, the earliest illustrated Haggadah, I believe. Uh, yes, it is indeed the earliest illustrated Haggadah, um, but it's not complete. But you can see that the instructions, typeset instructions, are in Judeo-Arabic. The font, bears no relation to uh, any other font known from Spain or Portugal from before the expulsion. So here we have a Haggadah with instructions in Judeo-Arabic. There are some samples of that uh, on the bottom left. You can see uh, the Judeo-Arabic uh, text. Um, you know how instructions are given in Haggadahs. Well, here the instructions are in Judeo-Arabic. Um, in uh, 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 inasmuch as there's no other known example of this, of this font, and there is no other known example of printing in Judeo-Arabic before 1500, other than the, the dictionary in Naples, um, one of the suggestions is that this was printed not in Spain or Portugal, but in Morocco, where after all, it was a completely Judeo-Arabic speaking uh, environment for Jews. Uh, in which case it would have been the first Hebrew character book, or excuse me, the first book ever printed on the continent of Africa. Uh, as it stands, the first book ever printed on the continent of Africa, in any case, is a Hebrew book. It was printed in 1516 uh, in Fez. But this may have been even before it because uh, it's so unusual. There's no other book with these types, and there's no other instance of Judeo-Arabic printing running texts, running instructional texts. So that's one of the explanations, but there, one thing is virtually certain, that it was printed uh, before the expulsion of the Jews from Spain or before 1500. Um, only one full-length text in Judeo-Arabic um, was printed before Pocock's Bab Musa. The Jewish polyglot Pentateuch produced by a member of the Sanchino family the Soncino family, the great uh, uh, Renaissance printing, uh, Jewish printing family in Istanbul in 1546, featured the original Hebrew, that's the main text in the middle, uh, together with Rashi's commentary and the small characters on the left, uh, together with versions in Aramaic, Targum that is, Judeo-Arabic and Judeo-Persian, all in Hebrew type. Those are the texts that surround the page. Excuse me, the Rashi is on the bottom, and the texts on the uh, top, right, and left are in those languages. Uh, the Arabic and Persian texts in this multilingual book, from the beginning end, and to end, every page is like this. So it's a book running text in Aramaic, a running book length text in Judeo Arabic, and a running book length text in Judeo Persian. The Arabic and Persian texts in this multilingual book are notable as the first Arabic text of any kind printed with movable type in the Levant or in any Arab or Islamic, uh, in any Islamic land, in any Islamic environment, and the first text ever printed in Persian anywhere. Now let me repeat, because this is an unusual phenomenon. The Sanchino polyglot, this book, stands out as the first Arabic printing, albeit in Hebrew characters in the East or in the entire um, Muslim world. There was some Arabic printing, not before this, in the century after this, um, for Syriac uh, Christians, Maronite Christians in the East, who were Arabic speaking. Uh, but they, at first, didn't even use Arabic types, they used Syriac types. Um, so they wrote, they printed Arabic in their sacred script, and then they began to print it in Arabic, um, in Arabic type but not in the Muslim world, in no Muslim environment, nowhere in the East, nowhere in North Africa, nowhere in, in, in Turkey, of course, nowhere else in the Muslim world, was there a text in Arabic printed before this book uh, in 1546. 
Um, not only was there no full-length work printed again in Judeo-Arabic until Pocock's edition of Maimonides over a century later, 1655. So this is 1546, more than a century passes, and Pocock in Oxford pr uh, produces a full book-length Ar original Arabic, uh, Judeo-Arabic text. Um, but after Pocock, there was no printing in an of an entire book in Judeo-Arabic for over 200 years, from 1546 until the middle of the 18th century. Uh, excuse me, 1646 until the end, middle of the, uh, Pocock was 50, uh, 1640, uh, 1655, until the middle of the 19th century, there was no other book printed in Judeo-Arabic. How can this, uh, how can this um, be? Well, it's simple. With the exception of a handful of short-lived attempts at Hebrew printing in Fez, Cairo, Safed in the Galilee, and in Tunis, over the three centuries before 1800, between 1500 and 1800, there were a handful of attempts at Hebrew printing. All pioneering attempts in each place where they were the first instance of printing, there was no other printing before the introduction of those Hebrew presses. Um, there, was no, uh, there was no other Jewish printing. Those, those few attempts were the only uh, instances of Jewish printing. And for that matter, there was no Muslim printing at all anywhere in the Arab world in the lands where Jews spoke and read Judeo-Arabic. Uh, those few instances, brief instances of Jewish printing were entirely in Hebrew. Uh, they didn't uh, begin to uh, uh, invest themselves, interest themselves in printing in Judeo-Arabic until long later. And in any case, there was almost no printing in, in Hebrew characters at all among Jews in any of these climes. Hebrew printing was limited to Europe and to um, uh, the uh, Ottoman centers in Istanbul, um, Salonika, um, Izmir, uh, uh, and so on. So, uh, but you know, within uh, the Turkish and um, uh, even Salonika was, was Turkish uh, at that time. So, you have a century before Pocock and two centuries after Pocock when there are no books in Judeo Arabic. Pocock comes along in the middle of nowhere, sitting in Oxford, printing an edition of an entire work, a Jewish work in uh, Judeo-Arabic. It was only with the opening and spread of Hebrew presses in the Arab world and elsewhere in Asia from the mid-19th century, literally from 1850 on, that books and newspapers began to appear in the Jewish vernacular, that is, in Judeo-Arabic. Thenceforth, and this was, as I said, two centuries after Pocock, books wholly or partly in Judeo-Arabic were printed in towns throughout North Africa, the Middle East, and beyond in such places as Algiers, Oran, Tunis, Aleppo, Jerusalem, Baghdad, Casablanca, Fez, um, uh, Sousse, Constantine, Tripoli, Rabat, Tlemcen, Cairo, Bombay, and Calcutta. Bombay and Calcutta by Jews from Baghdad who had settled uh, there. From the Maghreb, Ma Maghreb in the west to India, the subcontinent in the east. Though most presses had closed by the Second World War, some continued to exist until the 1960s, uh, the press in, um, in Tunis printed Judeo-Arabic for over a century, um, and the 1970s. And in uh, Tunisia, Judeo-Arabic printing carried on at Jerba, the Isle of Jerba, until the 1980s. So if you consider that it began, uh, Judeo-Arabic printing began in 1488, it carried on for five centuries. Um, thereafter in different corners of the um, Judeo-Arabic speaking world. So in short, Pocock's Porta Moses represented an astonishing array of firsts and unusual um, achievements. It's the first book-length text in Hebrew characters ever printed in Oxford. It's the first book-length text uh, printed principally in Judeo-Arabic. It's the first book-length original text in Jewish language other than Hebrew or Aramaic ever published by a non-Jewish uh, scholar. It's the first work in or about a Jewish language other than Hebrew or Aramaic published at Oxford. It's the first edition of an original Judeo-Arabic text as opposed to a Bible translation. It's the first edition of any work by Maimonides in the original Judeo-Arabic. Um, among them, um, many later editions were done by uh, Jewish scholars uh, in the 19th century and the 20th century. The founder of the Hebrew section of the Library of Congress published an edition, a partial edition of the same, um, of the same text. Um, and if you consider, you saw there was that title in Hebrew characters, two words, Bab Musa, at the top of the page. Um, it's also the first book in history that bears a title in Judeo-Arabic. 
Pocock published the first book with the title Angelo Arga. For all these reasons, Pocock's book merits notice both in terms of printing history and as a pioneering work in the field of Judeo-Arabic studies. Over the course of a thousand years from the 10th century to the 20th, Jews in various lands wrote Arabic and Hebrew characters. With very few exceptions, Jews did not write or publish Arabic in Arabic characters until the 20th century. And even then, this development was limited mostly to Baghdad and to a lesser degree, Cairo. Why is it, why was it in Baghdad and Cairo that this happened? Because if you remember, uh, Baghdad was a city equally divided between Jews, Christ uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Equal populations, third, third, third. Which means that the majority of the population of Baghdad was not Muslim. Therefore, Arabic was not identified as, uh, and Arabic characters were not identified as a language uniquely Muslim. Two-thirds of the population there didn't speak, didn't, um, uh, uh, were, not, were not Muslim. And therefore, the characters of Arabic were more acceptable to these populations. Christians had already begun to uh, write in Arabic characters. In the 20th century, Jews started to publish, and they became figures in the publishing industry and in writing in Judeo-Arabic, uh, excuse me, in, in Arabic. And those, the last Jews from Baghdad, from Iraq, who went to Israel, continued to write in uh, in Arabic, publish in Arabic, in Arabic characters um, in Israel. Uh, and Cairo to a lesser degree. There was a small amount in Cairo, but there again, it's because Cairo was a more, Egypt was a more cosmopolitan environment where you had uh, Arabic, you had French, um, uh, you had uh, populations from many parts of uh, Europe that were there. Uh, and uh, because of the cosmopolitan environment, uh, it seemed that Jews could also begin to enter the, uh, the world of, um, of Arabic uh, publishing. But uh, principally, Jewish uh, printing in, Ar in Cairo was in, uh, in Hebrew characters. There are even Yiddish books uh, printed in, uh, in Cairo. Uh, there are Yiddish theater posters from, uh, from uh, Cairo, but it was a very, a very, um, cosmopolitan in, in every sense um, um, environment. Uh, it's been suggested, in fact, that Jews, well, Jews did have some in involvement with Arabic printing going back very far in an interesting way. Soncino, that same Jewish printer of the Renaissance, may have been involved with the printing of the first book in Arabic characters printed in Italy, northern Italy, in 1505. How is that? Well, it wasn't a Muslim work, it was a Christian work. It was a work for Levantine Christians. It was the first book printed in, in Arabic type. Soncino had a type cutter, a famous type cutter, a Renaissance type cutter who worked for him, Francisco Griffo, an Italian. He was an expert type cutter and he cut the most beautiful Hebrew types which were used in all of the classical editions of Hebrew texts. He was then engaged by the printer in Fano to cut Arabic types. So in other words, you had two publishers sharing the type cutter, but they came to this type cutter, the, the, the Arabic um, editor, came to this type cutter via uh, Soncino. Uh, that was the first involvement of Jews uh, with uh, Arabic type, but it's not altogether certain, it's not clear what the, uh, the precise dimensions uh, of that uh, were. But there's no ambiguity whatsoever about another involvement of Jews in the cutting of Arabic type. And that's the case of Polish-born, Yiddish-speaking Joina Ashkenazi from Zelozitz in uh, Polish Ukraine, who in the 18th century established the major Hebrew printing house in the Ottoman capital, which functioned for about a century. Uh, directed by himself and then by his sons and descendants, which printed all of the Hebrew and uh, Ladino books in, Ladino, in, in Istanbul over the course of that century. He was a skilled type cutter. He's known to have cut not just the Hebrew types, but also the Arabic types for the uh, pioneering Hungarian-born Turkish printer, Mutaferika, who founded the first Muslim press and produced from 1728 the first Arabic character books in the Islamic world. So uh, you have this 
very unusual phenomenon of a Yiddish-speaking Jew from Poland settled in Istanbul. That was after the Khmelnytsky massacres when there was a movement of Jews, mostly to the west, but also to the east, uh, and a, 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 a type, a, a printing shop where they were speaking Yiddish. We have uh, accounts of the, print, of, the, of the printers in that shop speaking uh, Yiddish, even in the context of the Arabic uh, typecutting. And Yoyna uh, uh, um, Ashkenazi, Jona Ashkenazi, cut the Arabic types for the first books. There were 17 of them printed in Istanbul from 1728. Um, and those are the first uh, Islamic books in Arabic uh, type. And the Turkish printing historians all acknowledge this. Uh, the involvement of Jews in printing in other parts of the, uh, of the uh, Muslim world or Arab world are, uh, don't really figure in the histories. There's a lot, of, a lot of confusion about it. But in the case of the Turkish printing historians, they all acknowledge it because Mutaferika, the, the, uh, the magnate, the, uh, the, um, the, the, the founder, the, the spiritus movens of this printing um, um, uh, effort, acknowledged in his will that in his final testament, that the Jew, Jonah, must be paid. And because of that statement in his will, all of the uh, Turkish printing historians acknowledge the involvement of the Jew, Jonah, in the printing uh, activity. And there's more detail uh, about his involvement. And in fact, even in the Encyclopedia of Islam in Turkish, there's a long article that deals with the involvement of Jonah, Yoyna Ashkenazi, Jonah Ashkenazi, with uh, the uh, cutting of Arabic type for Mutaferika in Istanbul. The Hebrew scholarship, which flourished in Oxford before the expulsion of the Jews from the British Isles in 1290, a scholarship which bridged the Jewish and Christian worlds, was later preserved in the library of Corpus Christi College and pursued by numerous Hebraists over the centuries. Edward Pocock's edition of Maimonides' commentary on the Mishnah in Judeo-Arabic remains as a singular achievement in the annals of Christian Hebraism and Orientalism. At the same time, Porta Moses Bab Musa is a milestone in the printing of Judeo-Arabic, the most diffuse Jewish language after Yiddish, in which books ultimately appeared in dozens of towns between Fez in the west and Calcutta in the east, long after one single book was printed by Pocock in Oxford. If you forgive me, I would like to end on a personal note. Even if you don't forgive me, I'm going to end on a personal <laughs> note. Uh, 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago, in 1997, the then Crown Prince of Jordan, uh, Prince Hassan, who then didn't become king because there was a there was kind of a palace coup and he was uh, sidelined and his brother became king. But at the time, he was the Crown Prince. And his wife, the Princess Sarvath, whose daughter was studying at Christ Church. Uh, I remember her. She was in my college. Um, um, uh, in the 1990s. Um, they visited Oxford, the crown prince and his wife, and the princess, uh, where the prince himself had studied Hebrew years before. The crown prince, who would have become the, prince, the king of Jordan, studied Hebrew at Oxford. The royal couple took the opportunity to pay a call on the Oxford Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies, which was founded by the prince's Hebrew tutor, the late Dr. Patterson and where I was then librarian and lecturer in Hebrew bibliography. Um, now, they came with an entourage. They had uh, you know, security, their own security detail, uh, you know, armed security, and uh, all the dig dignitaries. Uh, they were brought to the library of the center, which was at that time a very modest uh, library, nothing to look at, and it was, it was, uh, it was, it was a surprise to me that it was decided, not by myself, that the crown prince and his wife would, and the whole entourage would be traipsed into this very, uh, some people here know that place, into this uh, very modest environment. It's uh, about seven miles outside of Oxford, ne ne next to a, um, a very nice um, um, English manor house. But this was a side farm building in which the Center for Hebrew Studies had put its library. So it's, it was uh, not a... a a, a very attractive, austere, um, uh, imposing environment. But he and the wife and the whole entourage come into the library. 
and I was asked to show them the archive. And that was even weirder because the archive was just a room filled with archival boxes. There was nothing there. I mean, you have a, a, a crown prince, the future king of Jordan, coming to look in a room filled with boxes of things that have nothing to do with him or anybody else. And, and uh, so I described the archive to him uh, and his wife and the whole entourage as they're all standing there in this room. And I uh, showed, I told him that this archive was a biographical archive of all, um, mostly Hebrew literature. Also, why does the crown prince have to know? Well, he studied Hebrew at Oxford. So um, a, a biographical archive of all of Hebrew literature, Zionist figures, and some other significant Jewish figures over time, over history, and other Western Jewish figures. But it was principally a, an archive devoted to uh, Hebrew writers and uh, Zionist history. But I described it as positively as I could, wondering why this whole thing is happening. And the crown prince says to me, do you have anything on my friend Arthur Hertzberg? <laughs> and <laughs> that was a big surprise to me. There was only one problem. This archive was mostly Hebrew literature, modern Hebrew literature, uh, uh, Israeli and Zionist history. There wasn't, I didn't believe there was much on anything Western there. So I knew that this was going to be a disaster. But since he asked, I had to go to the shelves, and it was all arranged in Hebrew characters. Uh, I went to the boxes of Hay, H. I flipped through, that's a wasting time to have an entourage of people there, flipping through the, the files to see if there's a file for Arthur Hertzberg. Go through all the files, there's no file, they're all standing there waiting. And then I remembered that there was a second sequence Kressel's archive, it was Getzel Kressel, the Hebrew bibliographer who assembled this archive over a course of a lifetime. Uh, most people consider me a, a, a maniac uh, who collects material and organizes it uh, incessantly, but I'm nothing, nothing compared to this great figure, uh, Kressel, who must have been cutting out newspapers for about 70 years and filing everything because the room was the, it was the size of this entire area, floor to ceiling, up to there, in archival boxes arranged alphabetically by names. It was entirely names. It was a biographical archive. I remember that the other sequence, uh, how did he call it? Um, uh, he had Ishim Hasuvim and Ishim something else important people and other people, uh, the, I, however he arranged it. Anyway, I, and there were lot, ladders. The ladder went all the way up. So the crown prince and his wife are standing there in the whole entourage, armed entourage, and I start climbing up this ladder. It's tall, it's like 10 feet tall. I start climbing up the ladder to look at the second sequence. And I find the box there for hay, or the boxes for hay. I start flipping through it. And there's a massive file on the crown prince's friend, Arthur Hertzberg. <laughs> so, um, but that wasn't the high point of the day for me. It was the most elevated point because I was 10 feet up. <laughs> but it was not the high point of the crown prince's visit. The high point of the crown prince, prince's visit and um, what was my only brush with royalty in the course of my career, um, I took the opportunity when the prince and princess were then brought into the main room of the library to show them Pocock's edition of, see I've been talking so much, I forgot to show you all these interesting things, so step back for a moment. Fez 1516, Safid Palestine 1577, those are the first books ever printed in those places in any language. Cairo 1740, that's the only book printed in any language in Egypt in the 18th century. Tunis 1768, that's the first book ever printed in Tunisia in any language and the only book printed in Tunisia in, seven, in the 18th century. It was very poorly printed, um, very, very poorly printed, which may be one reason the press didn't continue. Um, but it's the only book printed uh, there in the 18th century. Judeo-Arabic from Bombay, that's a lithograph, a newspaper, a uh, famous newspaper from Bombay, 1855, of the Baghdadis. Then you have Hebrew, English, and Judeo-Arabic at a time when the Jews of India were, were shifting from Judeo-Arabic to English. Um, and you have this trilingual edition of Pirkei Avot, 
um, from Calcutta, 1891. Uh, this is <clears throat> one of the first books after, after Pocock by a scholar in Europe, in a European scholar, actually a Jewish scholar, but a, a European scholar of an edition of a, um, a Judeo-Arabic text of Maimonides um, from Paris, 1857, uh, Judeo-Arabic from Baghdad, 1870, Baghdad, 1905, um, Algiers, 1905, this is beautiful, it's a, 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 um, an anthology of Algerian um, music, poetry. Um, the Jews preserved Algerian, the Algerian Diwan, the Algerian poetry, and uh, there was this beautiful edition printed in Algiers in 1905. Um, in Hebrew characters, Sus 1943, Rabat 1946, a guide to Jews um, for writing Arabic because they only wrote Judeo-Arabic and this book is a guide to them how to write Arabic. Um, Judeo-Arabic from Jerba, 1951. Um, uh, Hebrew and Judeo-Arabic from Tunis, 1955. Um, there you have other examples of uh, Hebrew words appearing on the top, on the top on the title, uh, what I call four titles, of uh, books in other Western languages. And you can see Portam, uh, Bab Musa is in that category, but it's the first one ever in Judeo-Arabic. All the other instances are, of course, in Hebrew. Um, that's, the, one of the, this, I, that's the first or second example of Jewish printing of Arabic. Jews printing Arabic in Arabic characters, not for somebody else, on their own behalf, from Tunis, 1860. Um, Adrianople, 1888, that's Turkish and Arabic characters. Hebrew and, Jude and Arabic from Cairo, that's Jewish printing of Arabic. That's uh, that book from Istanbul, the uh, one of the first books printed in Arabic characters uh, in the entire Muslim world with type cut by the Jewish uh, type cutter. It's not clear whether he was involved in the, in the illustrations. I like this book because it's the first Muslim work on the, on the discovery of America, printed in 1730. Um, but there is the high point of this visit of the Crown Prince, uh, where I displayed for them Pocock's edition of Ibn Maimun's Bab Musa, the first book ever printed in Judeo-Arabic. Um, and I should say, it was the only old book in the library of the Center for Hebrew and Jewish Studies. It was kept in a separate cabinet. This wasn't the great um, uh, historic collection of uh, early and rare Hebraic of, in the Bodleian Library. This was the modern collection of Hebraic in Oxford, but there was one old book in the, in the collection, and it was Pocock's edition of, of Bab Musa. Um, anyway, I thank you for all of your patience and attention. I want to thank you for an extraordinary lecture and just the, the vastness of your knowledge of all these Judeo hyphenated languages, just an extraordinary presentation. Um, I would like to invite everybody to a reception out in the Great Hall and you can continue the conversation and if you have any questions, of course you can ask them there. Thank you very much. <laughs>